Book Three, Chapters Five and Six of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book Three, Chapters Five and Six. Chapter Five. How Moses ascended up to Mount Sinai, and received laws from God, and delivered them to the Hebrews. Now Moses called the multitude together, and told them that he was going from them unto Mount Sinai to converse with God, to receive from him, and to bring back with him a certain oracle. But he enjoined them to pitch their tents near the mountain, and prefer the habitation that was nearest to God, before one more remote. When he had said this, he ascended up to Mount Sinai, which is the highest of all the mountains that are in that country, and is not only very difficult to be ascended by men, on account of its vast altitude, but because of the sharpness of its precipices also. Nay, indeed, it cannot be looked at without pain of the eyes, and besides this it was terrible and inaccessible, on account of the rumor that passed about, that God dwelt there. But the Hebrews removed their tents, as Moses had bidden them, and took possession of the lowest parts of the mountain, and were elevated in their minds, in expectation that Moses would return from God, with promises of the good things he had proposed to them. So they feasted and waited for their conductor, and kept themselves pure as in other respects, and not accompanying with their wives for three days, as he had before ordered them to do. And they prayed to God that he would favorably receive Moses in his conversing with him, and bestow some such gift upon them by which they might live well. They also lived more plentifully as to their diet, and put on their wives and children more ornamental and decent clothing than they usually wore. So they passed two days in this way of feasting, but on the third day, before the sun was up, a cloud spread itself over the whole camp of the Hebrews, such a one as none had before seen, and encompassed the place where they had pitched their tents. And while all the rest of the air was clear, there came strong winds that raised up large showers of rain, which became a mighty tempest. There was also such lightning as was terrible to those that saw it, and thunder, with its thunderbolts, were sent down, and declared God to be there present in a gracious way, to such as Moses desired he should be gracious. Now as to these matters, every one of my readers may think as he pleases, but I am under a necessity of relating this history as it is described in the sacred books. This sight, and the amazing sound that came to their ears, disturbed the Hebrews to a prodigious degree, for they were not such as they were accustomed to. And then the rumor that was spread abroad, how God frequented that mountain, greatly astonished their minds. So they sorrowfully contained themselves within their tents, as both supposing Moses to be destroyed by the divine wrath, and expecting the like destruction for themselves. When they were under these apprehensions, Moses appeared as joyful and greatly exalted. When they saw him, they were freed from their fear, and admitted of more comfortable hopes as to what was to come. The air also was become clear and pure of its former disorders, upon the appearance of Moses. Whereupon he called together the people to a congregation, in order to their hearing what God would say to them. And when they were gathered together, he stood on an eminence whence they might all hear him, and said, God has received me graciously, O Hebrews, as he has formerly done, and has suggested a happy method of living for you, and an order of political government, and is now present in the camp. I therefore charge you, for his sake and the sake of his works, and what we have done by his means, that you do not put a low value on what I am going to say, because the commands have been given to me that now deliver them to you, nor because it is the tongue of a man that delivers them to you, but if you have a due regard to the great importance of the things themselves, you will understand the greatness of him whose institutions they are, and who has not disdained to communicate them to me for our common advantage. For it is not to be supposed that the author of these institutions is barely Moses, the son of Amram and Yaakovet, but he who obliged the Nile to run bloody for your sakes, and tamed the haughtiness of the Egyptians by various sorts of judgments. He who provided a way through the sea for us. He who contrived a method of sending us food from heaven when we were distressed for want of it. He who made the water to issue out of a rock when we had very little of it before. He by whose means Adam was made to partake of the fruits both of the land and of the sea. 
He by whose means Noah escaped the deluge. He by whose means our forefather Abraham, of a wandering pilgrim, was made the heir of the land of Canaan. He by whose means Isaac was born of parents that were very old. He by whose means Jacob was adorned with twelve virtuous sons. He by whose means Joseph became a potent lord over the Egyptians. He it is who conveys these instructions to you by me as his interpreter. And let them be to you venerable, and contended for more earnestly by you than your own children and your own wives. For if you will follow them, you will lead a happy life, you will enjoy the land fruitful, the sea calm, and the fruit of the womb born complete, as nature requires. You will be also terrible to your enemies, for I have been admitted into the presence of God, and been made a hearer of his incorruptible voice. So great is his concern for your nation and its duration." When he had said this, he brought the people, with their wives and children, so near the mountain, that they might hear God himself speaking to them about the precepts which they were to practice, that the energy of what should be spoken might not be hurt by its utterance by that tongue of a man, which could but imperfectly deliver it to their understanding. And they all heard a voice that came to all of them from above, insomuch that no one of these words escaped them, which Moses wrote on two tables, which it is not lawful for us to set down directly, but their import we will declare. The first commandment teaches us that there is but one God, and that we ought to worship him only. The second commands us not to make the image of any living creature to worship it. The third, that we must not swear by God in a false matter. The fourth, that we must keep the seventh day by resting from all sorts of work. The fifth, that we must honor our parents. The sixth, that we must abstain from murder, the seventh, that we must not commit adultery, the eighth, that we must not be guilty of theft, the ninth, that we must not bear false witness, the tenth, that we must not admit of the desire of anything that is another's. Now when the multitude had heard God himself giving these precepts which Moses had discoursed of, they rejoiced at what was said, and the congregation was dissolved. But on the following days they came to his tent, and desired him to bring them, besides, other laws from God. Accordingly, he appointed such laws, and afterwards informed them in what manner they should act in all cases, which laws I shall make mention of in their proper time. But I shall reserve most of those laws for another work, and make there a distinct explication of them. When matters were brought to this state, Moses went up again to Mount Sinai, of which he had told them beforehand. He made his ascent in their sight, and while he stayed there so long a time, for he was absent from them forty days, fear seized upon the Hebrews, lest Moses should have come to any harm. Nor was there anything else so sad, and that so much troubled them, as the supposal that Moses was perished. Now there was a variety in their sentiments about it, some saying that he was fallen among wild beasts, and those that were of this opinion were chiefly such as were ill-disposed to him. But others said that he was departed and gone to God, but the wiser sort were led by their reason to embrace neither of those opinions with any satisfaction, thinking that as it was a thing that sometimes happens to men to fall among wild beasts and perish that way, so it was probable enough that he might depart and go to God on account of his virtue. They therefore were quiet and expected the event, yet were they exceeding sorry upon the supposal that they were deprived of a governor and a protector, such a one indeed as they could never recover again nor would this suspicion give them leave to expect any comfortable event about this man, nor could they prevent their trouble and melancholy upon this occasion. However, the camp durst not remove all this while, because Moses had bidden them afore to stay there. But when the forty days and as many nights were over, Moses came down, having tasted nothing of food usually appointed for the nourishment of men. His appearance filled the army with gladness, and he declared to them what care God had of them, and by what manner of conduct of their lives they might live happily, telling them that during these days of his absence he had suggested to him also that he would have a tabernacle built for him, into which he would descend when he came to them, and how we should carry it about with us when we removed from this place, and that there would be no longer any occasion for going up to Mount Sinai, but that he would himself come and pitch his tabernacle amongst us, and be present at our prayers as also that the tabernacle should be of such measures and construction as he had shown him, and that you are to fall to the work and prosecute it diligently. 
When he had said this, he showed them the two tables, with the Ten Commandments engraven upon them, five upon each table, and the writing was by the hand of God. Chapter 6 Concerning the tabernacle which Moses built in the wilderness, for the honor of God, and which seemed to be a temple. Hereupon the Israelites rejoiced at what they had seen and heard of their conductor, and were not wanting in diligence according to their ability, for they brought silver and gold and brass, and of the best sorts of wood, and such as would not at all decay by putrefaction. Camel's hair also, and sheepskins, some of them dyed of a blue color, and some of a scarlet, some brought the flower for the purple color, and others for white, with wool dyed by the flowers aforementioned, and fine linen and precious stones, which those that use costly ornaments set in ouches of gold. They brought also a great quantity of spices, for of these materials did Moses build the tabernacle, which did not at all differ from a movable and ambulatory temple. Now when these things were brought together with great diligence, for every one was ambitious to further the work even beyond their ability, he set architects over the works, and this by the command of God. And indeed the very same which the people themselves would have chosen, had the election been allowed to them. Now their names are set down in writing in the sacred books, and they were these, Besaleel, the son of Uri, of the tribe of Judah, the grandson of Miriam, the sister of their conductor, and Oholiab, file son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, now the people went on with what they had undertaken with so great alacrity that Moses was obliged to restrain them by making proclamation that what he had brought was sufficient, as the artificers had informed him. So they fell to work upon the building of the tabernacle. Moses also informed them, according to the direction of God, both what the measures were to be and its largeness, and how many vessels it ought to contain for the use of the sacrifices, the women also were ambitious to do their parts, about the garments of the priests, and about other things that would be wanted in his work, both for ornament and for the divine service itself. Now when all things were prepared, the gold and the silver and the brass and what was woven, Moses, when he had appointed beforehand that there should be a festival, and that sacrifices should be offered according to everyone's ability, reared up the tabernacle, and when he had measured the open court, fifty cubits broad and a hundred long, he set up brazen pillars, five cubits high, twenty on each of the longer sides, and ten pillars for the breadth behind. Every one of the pillars also had a ring. Their chapiters were of silver, but their bases were of brass. They resembled the sharp ends of spears, and were of brass fixed into the ground. Cords were also put through the rings, and were tied at their farther ends to brass nails of a cubit long, which at every pillar were driven into the floor and would keep the tabernacle from being shaken by the violence of winds. But a curtain of fine soft linen went round all the pillars, and hung down in a flowing and loose manner from their chapiters, and enclosed the whole space, and seemed not at all unlike to a wall about it. And this was the structure of three of the sides of this enclosure. But as for the fourth side, which was fifty cubits in extent, and was the front of the whole, twenty cubits of it were for the opening of the gates, wherein stood two pillars on each side, after the resemblance of open gates. These were made wholly of silver and polished, and that all over, excepting the bases, which were of brass. Now on each side of the gates there stood three pillars, which were inserted into the concave bases of the gates, and were suited to them, and round them was drawn a curtain of fine linen. But to the gates themselves, which were twenty cubits in extent, and five in height, the curtain was composed of purple, and scarlet, and blue, and fine linen, and embroidered with many and diverse sorts of figures, excepting the figures of animals. Within these gates was the brazen laver for purification, having a basin beneath of the like matter, whence the priests might wash their hands and sprinkle their feet. And this was the ornamental construction of the enclosure about the court of the tabernacle, which was exposed to the open air. As to the tabernacle itself, Moses placed it in the middle of that court, with its front to the east, that when the sun arose, it might send its first rays upon it. Its length, when it was set up, was thirty cubits, and its breadth was twelve, ten cubits. The one of its walls was on the south, and the other was exposed to the north, and on the back part of it remained the west. It was necessary that its height should be equal to its breadth, ten cubits. There were also pillars made of wood, twenty on each side. They were wrought into a quadrangular figure, 
in breadth a cubit and a half, but the thickness was four fingers. They had thin plates of gold affixed to them on both sides, inwardly and outwardly. They had each of them two tenons belonging to them, inserted into their bases, and these were of silver, in each of which bases there was a socket to receive the tenon, but the pillars on the west wall were six. Now all these tenons and sockets accurately fitted one another, insomuch that the joints were invisible, and both seemed to be one entire and united wall. It was also covered with gold, both within and without. The number of pillars was equal on the opposite sides, and there were on each part twenty, and every one of them had the third part of a span in thickness, so that the number of thirty cubits were fully made up between them. But as to the wall behind, where the six pillars made up together only nine cubits, they made two other pillars, and cut them out of one cubit, which they placed in the corners, and made them equally fine with the other. Now every one of the pillars had rings of gold affixed to their fronts outward, as if they had taken root in the pillars, and stood one road over against another round about, though which were inserted bars gilt over with gold, each of them five cubits long, and these bound together the pillars, the head of one bar running into another, after the nature of one tenon inserted into another. But for the wall behind there was but one row of bars that went through all the pillars, into which row ran the ends of the bars on each side of the longer walls, the male with its female being so fastened in their joints that they held the whole firmly together, and for this reason was all this joined so fast together that the tabernacle might not be shaken, either by the winds or by any other means, but that it might preserve itself quiet and immovable continually. As for the inside, Moses parted its length into three partitions. At the distance of ten cubits from the most secret end, Moses placed four pillars, the workmanship of which was the very same with that of the rest, and they stood upon the like bases with them, each a small matter distant from his fellow. Now the room within those pillars was the most holy place, but the rest of the room was the tabernacle, which was open for the priests. However, this proportion of the measures of the tabernacle proved to be an imitation of the system of the world, for that third part thereof which was within the four pillars, to which the priests were not admitted, is, as it were, a heaven peculiar to God. But the space of the twenty cubits is, as it were, sea and land, on which men live, and so this part is peculiar to the priests only. But at the front, where the entrance was made, they placed pillars of gold that stood on bases of brass in number seven. But then they spread over the tabernacle veils of fine linen and purple and blue and scarlet colors embroidered. The first veil was ten cupids every way, and this they spread over the pillars which parted the temple and kept the most holy place concealed within. And this veil was that which made this part not visible to any. Now the whole temple was called the holy place, but that part which was within the four pillars, and to which none were admitted, was called the holy of holies. This veil was very ornamental, and embroidered with all sorts of flowers which the earth produces, and there were interwoven into it all sorts of variety that might be an ornament, excepting the forms of animals. Another veil was which covered the five pillars that were at the entrance. It was like the former in its magnitude and texture and color, and at the corner of every pillar a ring retained it from the top downwards half the depth of the pillars, the other half affording an entrance for the priests who crept under it. Over this there was a veil of linen of the same largeness with the former. It was to be drawn this way or that way by cords, the rings of which, fixed to the texture of the veil, and to the cords also, were subservient to the drawing and undrawing of the veil, and to the fastening it at the corner, that then it might be no hindrance to the view of the sanctuary, especially on solemn days, but that on other days, and especially when the weather was inclined to snow, it might be expanded, and afford a covering to the veil of diverse colors. Whence that custom of ours is derived, of having a fine linen veil, after the temple has been built, to be drawn over the entrances. But the ten other curtains were four cubits in breadth, and twenty-eight in length, and had golden clasps in order to join the one curtain to the other, which was done so exactly that they seemed to be one entire curtain. These were spread over the temple, and covered all the top and parts of the walls, on the sides and behind, so far as within one cubit of the ground. There were other curtains of the same breadth with these, but one more in number, and longer, for they were thirty cubits long. But these were woven of hair, with the like subtlety of those of wool were made, and were extended loosely down to the ground, appearing like a triangular front, an elevation at the gates, 
the eleventh curtain being used for this very purpose. There were also other curtains made of skins above these, which afforded covering and protection to those that were woven both in hot weather and when it rained. And great was the surprise of those who viewed these curtains at a distance, for they seemed not at all to differ from the color of the sky. But those that were made of hair and of skins reached down in the same manner as did the veil at the gates, and kept off the heat of the sun, and what injury the rains might do. And after this manner was the tabernacle reared. There was also an ark made, sacred to God, of wood that was naturally strong and could not be corrupted. This was called Aaron in our own language. Its construction was thus. Its length was five spans, but its breadth and height was each of them three spans. It was covered all over with gold, both within and without, so that the wooden part was not seen. It had also a cover united to it by golden hinges, after a wonderful manner, which cover was every way evenly fitted to it, and had no eminences to hinder its exact conjunction. There were also two golden rings belonging to each of the longer boards, and passing through the entire wood, and through them gilt bars passed along each board, that it might thereby be moved and carried about, as occasion should require. For it was not drawn in a cart by beasts of burden, but borne on the shoulders of the priests." Upon this its cover were two images, which the Hebrews call cherubims. They are flying creatures, but their form is not like to that of any of the creatures which men have seen, though Moses said he had seen such beings near the throne of God. In this ark he put the two tables whereon the Ten Commandments were written, five upon each table, and two and a half upon each side of them, and this ark he placed in the most holy place. But in the holy place he placed a table, like those at Delphi, its length was two cubits, and its breadth one cubit, and its height three spans. It had feet also, the lower half of which were complete feet, resembling those which the Dorians put to their bedsteads. But the upper parts toward the table were wrought into a square form. The table had a hollow towards every side, having a ledge of four fingers' depth that went round about like a spiral, both on the upper and lower part of the body of the work. Upon every one of the feet was there also inserted a ring, not far from the cover, through which went bars of wood beneath, but gilded, to be taken out upon occasion, there being a cavity where it was joined to the rings, for they were not entire rings, but before they came quite round they ended in acute points, the one of which was inserted into the prominent part of the table, and the other into the foot, and by these it was carried when they journeyed. Upon this table, which was placed on the north side of the temple, not far from the most holy place, were laid twelve unleavened loaves of bread, six upon each heap, one above another. They were made of two-tenth deals of the purest flour, which tenth deal, in Omer, is a measure of the Hebrews, containing seven Athenian kotolo. And above those loaves were put two vials full of frankincense. Now after seven days other loaves were brought in their stead, on the day which is by us called the Sabbath, for we call the seventh day the Sabbath. But for the occasion of this intention of placing loaves here, we will speak to it in another place. Over against this table, near the southern wall, was set a candlestick of cast gold, hollow within, being of the weight of one hundred pounds, which the Hebrews call chincheris. If it be turned into the Greek language, it denotes a talent. It was made with its knops and lilies and pomegranates and bowls, which ornaments amounted to seventy in all, by which means the shaft elevated itself on high from a single base, and spread itself into as many branches as there are planets, including the sun among them. It terminated in seven heads, in one row, all standing parallel to one another, and these branches carried seven lamps, one by one, in imitation of the number of the planets. These lamps looked to the east and to the south, the candlestick being situate obliquely. Now between this candlestick and the table, which, as we said, were within the sanctuary, was the altar of incense, made of wood indeed, but of the same wood of which the foregoing vessels were made, such as was not liable to corruption. It was entirely crusted over with a golden plate. Its breadth on each side was a cubit, but the altitude double. Upon it was a grate of gold, that was extant above the altar, which had a golden crown encompassing it round about, whereto belonged rings and bars, by which the priest carried it when they journeyed. Before this tabernacle there was reared a brazen altar, but it was within made of wood, five cubits by measure on each side, but its height was but three. 
in like manner adored with brass plates as bright as gold. It had also a brazen hearth of network, for the ground underneath received the fire from the hearth, because it had no basis to receive it. Hard by this altar lay the basins and the vials and the censers and the cauldrons made of gold, but the other vessels made for the use of the sacrifices were all of brass, and such was the construction of the tabernacle, and these were the vessels thereto belonging. End of Book 3, Chapters 5 and 6 Recording by Lynn Handler